Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Caitlin Mueller, and I'm associate professor at MIT in architecture and civil and environmental engineering, where I direct the digital structures research group. My talk today is entitled creative computing for high performance architecture. And in this talk, I'll show you some of the work and ideas and tools and methodologies that my research group has been working on. Um, we're a group at MIT that are interdisciplinary across architecture, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, applied math, and what unites us is our interest in high performance design through computation. One of the things that we find in our interdisciplinary work is that high performance design doesn't necessarily mean convergence to a single idea, which is a common misconception. These are some of my favorite buildings and structures from around the world and probably some of yours as well. And we could say all of them are efficient, they use material intelligently, they're high performing, but they're also really different from each other. The types of materials they use, the types of structural action, the, the way the space is organized, all of this shows that there's a really diverse and um, creative range of ways that we can use material responsibly. And this can actually expand the palette of design to think this way, to use structural performance as a design driver can actually expand our creative potential as designers and engineers. I think it's also really important that we consider performance in design um, because of the enormous impact that the built environment has on the climate crisis. About 40% of emissions worldwide are due to uh, the built environment. And those emissions are due, of course, both to the operational energy and carbon, but also due to the energy and carbon associated with constructing buildings, with materials, production, transportation. And for a long time, embodied energy has not received a lot of attention, at least not in mainstream um, architectural discourse. And that has led to really wide disparities in how op um, embodied energy is, is used. So for example, in these two Olympic stadia, the Beijing Olympic Stadium on the left uses 14 times the embodied carbon per seat compared to the London Olympic Stadium on the right. And that's not 14% more, that's 14 times more, a performance differential that we would never see in any other performance driven industry. In the automobile industry and aerospace, we would not have one airplane that was 14 times more fuel efficient than another. And yet this happens all the time in buildings. It's not that these, one of these designs is bad and the other design is good from a kind of a qualitative aesthetic perspective, but it's that performance was not one of the drivers in the design process. Today, we can't afford to work this way anymore. We really need to use performance as an input into design um, that still allows us to be creative um, and still allows us to have agency and authorship as designers. I think one of the reasons that this is so challenging is because of the way our disciplines are organized. I personally have a background and I teach in both architectural design and in structural engineering. And I've noticed how different we think, differently we think about things. So we think about computation and use computation very differently. We think about materialization and fabrication in different terms. And even our educational approaches are very different for these two disciplines, even though they're literally working on the same thing, the design of buildings. And so I'm really committed to trying to find ways to build links between these disciplines and to empower better collaborations and interactions uh, towards integrated design, which I think both intellectually and practically is of uh, critical importance. Of course, I'm not the first person to say this. Um, people have been talking about this for decades since before I was born. These are two um, presentations uh, in the UK in the 1960s by important engineers and architects who have been debating the relationship and the roles of architects and engineers uh, for decades, as I said. And what's so interesting about these pieces is that some, in some ways they read like they could be written today. However, there's been one major change since the 1960s, and that's the introduction of computing, both for design and analysis. In 1963, engineers at Arab held a symposium on the use of computers where they worried about whether the computer was going to take over their, their jobs, whether it was going to take over the role of design specifically. And they, were, they, they assured themselves that the computer doesn't have an imagination, and so design wouldn't be fully automated. I would say, actually, in fact, computing has, in some ways, served to separate the disciplines further um, rather than combining them or uniting them in some kind of automated design process. Um, if we think about how computing is used today, on the one hand in architecture, it can be used for ideating, for creating design ideas. A design might be selected, but then usually it's sent over to the engineer's office, it can take a while to get a, an answer. The engineer uses computation to run an analysis and then says, uh-oh, this design doesn't work. We need to try another one. So back to the architect's office, pick another idea, 
send it all the way over to the engineer's office. Again, we get an answer this time. OK, this design works. Let's move forward. This is obviously not an insufficient design process. This doesn't allow us to explore the expanse of possible design ideas with engineering information. It's really a, a very inefficient guess and check process. But I'd say this is about 85% of uh, buildings in, in today's world are designed with uh, methods like these. How can we improve this? One idea is to build better connections between the methods of design and the methods of analysis. So for example, um, we can build tools that link geometry generation with simulation and analysis so that this time to get an answer becomes much faster. So we can explore more options, um, have, a, have a larger range of possible ideas, but this is still essentially trial and error. Can we do even better than this? Uh, I would argue yes. Um, we could systematize the process. So rather than manually trying different ideas, we could create what's called a design space. We could establish design variables or design parameters that that can control the design or that can generate different design alternatives and connect that all the way through our simulation. And this looks very similar to, I think, what we're seeing a lot at this conference and what people are very excited about. But I think even this idea, which is fairly common in, in research and in presentations, isn't really used for most buildings still. I would say this is about 3% of buildings are truly designed in the conceptual design phase with this kind of approach. And still, this is really not, um, uh, you know, taking advantage of the full power of computation, this is just even, fa even faster trial and error, I would say. Now, if we were designing an airplane, there's a pretty obvious solution for what we would do here. Um, we would loop the whole thing together and connect the analysis method to the design variables into what's called an optimization problem, where we could then find the best solution to this problem uh, that minimizes our objective function, for example, minimizes the structural weight of the building um, in response to uh, changing the design variables. Um, this is a fully automated approach to design. I think this is very, very rarely used, maybe almost never used to in, in architecture, although it's really common in a lot of other fields. Why is this not used in the design of buildings? Is it because this is too mathematically intractable for architects and engineers. It's just, uh, it's too technically difficult and people don't have the educations to do this. Maybe, but I really don't think that's the main reason. I think the main issue uh, with this optimization method, which works so well in other disciplines, is that it's really, really hard to adapt to the humanistic aspects of design that are so critical in the design of buildings and architecture. Um, so for example, optimization gives us a single answer. It has um, a numerical objective function. We have to measure the thing that we care about completely in numbers. That's really hard for buildings. It's automated. We don't have a way to exert our intent or our control. Mm -hmm. It can also still be slow. So it takes a really long time to get an answer. And in buildings, we're usually working on a, a really fast time scale. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole thing, the whole idea of design variables can feel very unnatural compared to analog, more open-ended free design processes. It's really hard to constrain ourselves into these formalized design spaces. Sometimes we run this whole analysis, this whole process, and we get a very obvious solution at the end. So we ask ourselves, is it even worth all, the, all of this effort? And then finally, a lot of times these methods are dis uh, disconnected from materialization and construction. Are there ways that we can use this process, but make it more relevant to the design of buildings? I would say yes, and I'd say it's really important that we do so, because we really do need to use performance as a design driver, just not necessarily through traditional optimization. Um, what I'm really interested in within this optimization framework is the idea of the design space. This is an illustration of a design space for a simple truss. It's a simply supported truss with a central point load. We can move the lower left node up and down and left and right. And as we do that, the amount of material that's required to support the load changes, creates, and we can create this three-dimensional landscape where the vertical and horizontal position, the two variables form the X and Y axes, and the Z axis is the amount of material needed. And we can see in this landscape, for example, that there are two optimal solutions. There's the global optimum and the local optimum. And again, we can find these optimal solutions using algorithms that have been around since before I was born, but they're almost never used. And again, as I said, I think part of that is because it's really hard to mathematically define all of the things we care about in design. Material reduction is certainly a critical goal, especially as it relates to climate change, but it's not the only one. It, we don't wanna build an optimal building from a materials perspective if it's not comfortable to be in, if no one wants to use the space. That would actually be an even worse waste of material to build something that is undesirable for occupants. So we really need to be able to account for these qualitative goals. 
But luckily the design space can allow us to do that. If we relax um, a, a little bit from the, the single optimal solution to the space, we can see that the design space contains a multitude of really interesting options. And we can focus on the ones that perform well according to the metrics that we can quantify. So for example, uh, the, these designs that I'm showing on the right perform 10, 20, 30% worse than the very best design, but still pretty well. And they contain a lot of diversity. And so among those, I might, I might find a solution that is uh, the best balance of, of these holistic quantitative and qualitative goals that I have. In my research, I'm really interested in building tools and workflows to exploit this idea of design space exploration, of, of not just finding the optimal solution, but using the design space to orient our search, our, our design processes towards designs that perform well. Um, an early tool that I built to do this is called Structure Fit, which uses an interactive evolutionary algorithm to present design options that perform well to a human user, to give information about how each design performs. In this case, again, it's the total material required to support given loads, which is computed using a finite element analysis and a sizing optimization algorithm. And it's normalized according to the design we started with. So a lower number means it performs better. And then the user is able to select from among those choices the ones that they like the best for qualitative reasons, for aesthetics, for cultural reasons, for fit, for history, for context. And those selections are used to create new options. They're fed back into the evolutionary algorithm. And so this is really a collaborative process between the computer and the human where the best design is found together. I also really believe in giving humans the final say in design processes and not, again, producing results that are fully automated. And so here I have a final fine tuning step where the, where the user is able to make small corrections and again, get real time performance information. We see that using techniques like this can produce really interesting designs. So for example, in 3D, uh, similarly, we can start to find designs that exploit the power of load paths in three dimensions, which are even more interesting and, and diverse. And so we can get really um, fascinating catalogs of design options that uh, are not based on a single answer, but that really reveal um, a diverse range of options that are still high performing. We can also apply this thinking to what's called multi-objective optimization, where we have multiple goals or priorities that we know how to quantify and that might trade off with each other. That's incredibly common in design. And we deal with this all the time kind of in non-algorithmic ways where we understand if I make the design better according to this metric, I'm gonna to have to give up a little bit on this other metric. In this example, we're looking at trade-offs between operational energy consumption and embodied energy in a shell-like structure. And the, the intuition here is that as you make the shell flatter, you need more material to support the loads because it becomes a less efficient structure. There's, there's higher forces in the structure but it becomes more efficient from an operational energy perspective because there's less surface area and heat transfer with the outside air and less air to heat and cool. So this kind of trade-off can be explored with this Pareto front, which shows these, these different options and, and shows you how they perform in both. And what multi-objective optimization allows us to do is to find this set, not a single solution, but a set of solution that represents different weights between our different goals. This is rarely used also, and I think it's, it's a really important idea because it, it allows different disciplines to collaborate together who normally are sort of working in isolation or in a linear fashion. If we go back to this idea though of design space exploration, one of the issues that we find is that the design space often actually contains too much data. So for example, if I parameterize this long span roof truss, I can very easily end up with way more data than I can handle um, manually or even with, a, with kind of naive computational approaches. So here, if I sample this design space that I have randomly, uh, I'm only showing this 0, 0.0, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, percentage of the design space, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's in unsatisfactory. And if I cared about how all these designs performed, it would take me a really long time to get an answer. So really, really slow to analyze all of them. And then maybe I can focus on the designs that perform well. But functionally, we, we're, we're in this, um, we've run into this problem of scale, where as we have more design variables, it becomes harder for us to deal with these kinds of computational approaches. And so recently, a lot of my work has dealt with, with this question. Specifically, we have this challenge that, uh, again, we want to balance automation with creative design. Um, but we, and we want to do so in a way that is natural and intuitive for humans. We know that designers are becoming more and more competent and excited about computation, and they have a lot of data. And so that's led us to investigate machine learning as a potential way to make computational design more relevant to humans. One of the ways that we've done that um, is through something called surrogate modeling, 
which is based on the idea that we want feedback from simulations very, very quickly. Um, there's theory that says for direct manipulation, we want feedback that's on the order of less than 0.1 seconds. For uninterrupted creative flow, which is a kind of psychological term for the, the process in which we are creative, we want a response time between 0.1 seconds and one second. And at least we want a response in less than 10 seconds. And a lot of tools operate beyond this, um, this, this time scale that we care about. And so surrogate modeling is a way to fix that. The basic idea is it's a supervised learning technique that takes training data based on real simulations and produces a regression model that can be used to instantaneously predict the performance of unseen designs. This can be used to predict single design performance values, but also whole fields of information. In this case, a designer is sculpting the shape of a shell and gets real-time performance information across the entire shell's domain. In this case, we're visualizing the X, Y, and Z displacements um, instantaneously through a surrogate model. So we no longer have to go to another program. We no longer have to wait seconds or minutes or hours, but we can immediately explore the relationship of form and performance in an integrated manner. We can also use this not only to predict simulation results, but even to predict things like optimal distributions of material, which are traditionally computed themselves through slow optimization algorithms. Um, we've been able to show that surrogate modeling can predict the result of, uh, of a topology optimization algorithm with pretty good accuracy across a large number of problems. Um, the error is around 10%, but it's almost, it's more than two orders of magnitude faster than running the real topology optimization. What that means is that this can really be part of a interactive instantaneous design process in which things like the global form of a structure can immediately connect to the optimal distribution of material within that form and even go to things like how that material will, will actually be built or materialized from the topology optimization result. In this version, we're using the topology optimization result not directly to create the formal materialization, but to inform another step of a waffle shell-like pattern on the structure whose voids are sized according to the results of the topology optimization. What's, what's so powerful about this being so fast is that we're compressing a process that's traditionally quite long, weeks or months, going from really um, abstract design concept all the way through ma to materialized design. We can do this now in seconds. Either that means the design process can be much faster, but what I hope it means is that we can explore much more. We have much more time to be creative and not spend time on, on dealing with software issues and waiting for responses. So I hope that can also improve the, the outcomes for design in the built environment. So I think these surrogate models offer compact, portable, and instantaneous information um, to inject into creative design processes. Right now, a lot of our work is focusing on how we can make these models um, really generalizable so that you don't need a lot of training data for each fresh problem and that you don't need pre-parameterized uh, design spaces to operate on. So I don't have that work to show today, but that's the kind of ongoing work we're doing in this area. Then another question I'm interested in is once we have this instantaneous feedback, how can we use it to organize these enormous design spaces that are sometimes intractable? One idea also from machine learning is to use an unsupervised algorithm called clustering to identify families or relationships, essentially to assign a hierarchy to these otherwise kind of extremely noisy and vast spaces. So in this example, we use something called k-means clustering to find groups of families so that designers might be have a kind of more palatable menu of options to choose from that they can start to understand relative to each other. We're also interested in using learning to question the idea of variables themselves. I said earlier that they are natural. And what I mean by that is these kinds of the controls or sliders that we have in parametric design aren't really getting at what we care about. What we really care about are the performance values or the objectives. It would be really nice if we could just have a slider to say, make the design stiffer or improve the daylight in this building. We can't do that directly because it's an inverse problem, but we can use learning to start, start understanding those relationships and synthesize new variables that find that re represent directions of, of performance. So in this case, we're finding linear combinations of existing variables that correspond most to, to performance metrics that we care about. In this example, we're, we're coming up with three new synthetic variables, again, that correspond with performance information so that we are cutting down our search through this enormous space into areas that are relevant and meaningful, both visually, creatively, but also from a performance perspective. More recently, we've been exploring a similar idea of synthetic variables or design space reduction, or sometimes called dimensionality reduction, 
using something called variational autoencoders, which are a relatively recent advance in the deep learning world. And what this is, what this is, is it's a technique for taking high dimensional data, compressing it into a low dimensional representation, and then being able to project back out of that space into high dimensional space again. We're doing this in a way specifically paying attention to performance. So we call this conditioned variational autoencoders. And the condition is, please project designs into a low dimensional space and focus on the designs that perform well. So take this really complicated large dimensional space and turn it into a landscape that's meaningful. And what that looks like practically, if we go back to our roof problem, is we've taken a, a problem that's 36 variables and we've turned it into one that's again, just two. We can visually see the landscape of performance versus design choice. And we can literally move around and click as an interface in this design landscape to explore our options. It's very manageable, but it also contains a really diverse range of solutions, although all of them perform well because of this conditioning. And so you can see that geometric variation of what we're able to find is, is much more exciting than if we really only had two variables. Um, the conditioning also gives us another means of control. Uh, this axis on the bottom, the P, is how much performance matters. So if, if we have a low P value, that means we really want only high performing designs. But if we increase P, we can also increase our diversity, relax performance a little bit further. And so this is another meta control on the types of options that we might ex explore. And again, you see even in this landscape where we, have, we don't have a very high probability of high performance, we have a lot of variation and still some really interesting options. And so this is kind of a new way to think about parametric design space exploration. And so we can go from this kind of mess of samples that are very hard to understand to something that starts to really make sense and yet still contains um, surprising and new solutions. If we connect this idea with the surrogate modeling that I showed earlier, um, we can get instantaneous performance information, even instantaneous materialization information in this really nice two-dimensional latent landscape that is human legible. And I would argue that that enables us to be creative as we explore it. So I think these, um, these variable transformation techniques are, are really powerful as a way for us to make sense of complex design spaces. And we're working on um, disseminating these ideas through tools and also adapting them to multi-objective problems. The last area that I wanted to show in, learning, in my learning work today um, relates to the idea of human interfaces also, but in an even more analog way, where we acknowledge that Analog design methods like sketching still reign supreme in design. They are incredibly powerful because of the freedom of a blank piece of paper. Parametric and computational design pale in, the, in comparison to this and the ability to truly express new ideas from the human imagination. And so what we've been really interested in in this work is finding ways to connect sketches, which again, represent this really free open design process with performance information, instantaneous prediction of performance information, and then even the ability to suggest variations on these sketches. So in this work, uh, the designer creates a sketch. We've linked it to a machine learning model that can use a surrogate model to give instantaneous performance prediction. And then using this latent landscape, we can then interpolate between these options. For example, one is an, uh, the design of an architect and the other is the design of an engineer or the design of two different collaborators or two ideas you've had yourself. And we can start to ideate collaboratively with the users to find new design options with the input of the sketch. We're also working on, on teaching these ideas and methods to students and practitioners who are interested. So at MIT, we have a class where we've, we've started teaching these ideas, but we're also developing a, a free MOOC um, on the edX platform that will be launching in a few months. So if anyone's interested in learning more about these techniques, I, I encourage you to join us in this class. We also distribute a lot of our ideas through free and open source tools, um, in this case from Rhino and Grasshopper. So you're, you're very welcome to take a look at these as well. And please let us know if you, if you have questions. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about a little bit about materialization and fabrication, because a lot of these designs that are efficient from a performance perspective, especially from a material usage perspective, are also um, very complex and arguably really inefficient and expensive to build, at least by conventional methods. One of the areas that I think can, can um, address this problem is digital fabrication and robotic assembly, which really flips the script on construction economics and can make geometrically comp uh, complex but materially efficient designs possible to build economically. 
So here's an example of this. This is a, a design morphing to become more efficient, this kind of high-tech lattice structure. Um, as it becomes more efficient, however, every node is different. Every member has a different length. Conventional construction would say this is going to be really, really expensive to build, despite these claimed um, computational efficiencies. Mm -hmm. But with digital fabrication, um, the claim, of course, is that complexity is, is free. It's probably not free, but complexity comes at a different cost than in conventional construction. So for example, we can this robot doesn't care if every node is different or if every member has a different length. It extrudes the material the same way no matter what, um, based on the instructions that it's been given and can, can then therefore create these structures that are really lightweight, really, I think, aesthetically powerful that express a new aesthetic of performance. And so I think digital fabrication is a way for us to start unlocking this new aesthetic of performance and making it really feasible in our current economic context. Um, we're interested in this not only for kind of these lattice structures, but just more generally for, for any kind of complex form. So one of the most types, one of the most complex forms you can create is the result of a topology optimization, where it's really every member is literally exactly where it needs to be structurally, but then you get these really interesting and complex topologies. Robotic fabrication and assembly uh, can be really powerful as a way to construct these efficiently, especially when connected to automatic path planning and sequence planning tools like Choreo, which is a tool we're developing in my group, which can automate the, the sequence and the robotic instructions for constructing really complex structurally driven forms like this topology optimized beam or bridge. And what this means is that uh, we don't have to manually explain to the robot how to build this. Both the sequence and all of the instructions for the robot's kinematics and collision avoidance are automated. This automated process is becoming fast enough that it could become a design driver. We could use that as one of the objectives in a design process itself. So these efficient but complex forms, I think, are becoming more and more attainable through these digital fabrication techniques. We can also apply this thinking to more conventional structures that have impacts around the world. For example, in this work, we're looking at reinforced concrete floor systems, which are used ubiquitously in many cities in the global south, which are really important to solving the global housing crisis, but which also contain a huge amount of embodied carbon. We can reduce that embodied carbon, of course, by intelligent structural shaping, and we can do that flexibly. It doesn't have to be a single solution. We can develop using design space exploration and an intelligent integration of fabrication constraints. We can integrate a, a range of possible technical solutions based on what people can build in different contexts. Our method for this uses something called constrained optimization. We use it, we do we run this in one of the tools that we give away for free in Rhino and Grasshopper. And what it does is it, it checks the concrete beam. Um, at, in sections along its length, the constraints are code-based shear and moment and deflection checks. And the goal is to minimize the embodied energy in this case of the structure. And you can see how it arrives on, in a structure that's balancing steel and concrete and also meeting all of these co code requirements. Working with people um, on the ground who know fabrication techniques in the context where they work, we can adapt this technique to different places. In this case, we used singly curved laser cut steel formwork to create a structure that um, in this case used, um, I think about half the material as a one-way flat slab performed um, as expected in load testing mm -hmm. and can be really used not only to create uh, really efficient housing, but I think also again, creates a new aesthetic of performance um, where structure can be exposed and can really contribute positively to the spatial experience. These ideas can also be applied to building systems in timber, where similarly, we're seeing a renaissance and an interest in timber, but we know structurally we don't need to make everything out of rectangular blocks. And in fact, removing material is both possible um, with fabrication methods and a good idea in terms of the aesthetics and uh, experience of the space. So finally, to conclude, um, I feel strongly that our climate crisis demands that our design processes in the built environment directly consider performance and that these advances in digital fabrication and um, computation and learning can empower more direct and natural links between the power of systematic design space exploration and the creativity of human driven design and the economics of construction um, of the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was that was fantastic, and I'm I'm sure that everybody in the audience will uh, agree that they're uh, sitting there uh, astounded by um, the way that you've brought together so many of the things that we talked about in the earlier presentations today. Thank you very much. Um, we're we're getting getting questions through from the chat, and um, the, anybody who is um, typing their questions in that in that chat box, please please do, and they will be um, passed on, uh, and we'll we'll address them to Caitlin. I think I'd like to, to kick off by um, asking you uh, a question or sort of um, uh, wondering how you're how you're thinking about um, uh, the you've talked a lot about maintaining the creativity in the design you you know you, you cited that original sort of Arab um, uh, meeting about worrying about you know how how do we keep that 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 human creativity that that we as selfishly as humans still want to be have our fingers in the pie we want to be part of this process even if we could develop the, the most intelligent and creative as you've shown um computational techniques um but when when we're using those tools um to not only explore a design space but to define what the design space is um because one of the best values you've shown is it's choosing the axes it's not exploring where you are in the space it's what are the axes in the first place that I should be exploring. Um, how do you think that that will affect the use of both architects and engineers using that and falling into the inherently human trap of letting go of our creativity and saying, oh, but that's the best answer because this said it's the best answer on this set of axes. How do we keep that control and make sure that we're still educating everyone that we're working with, or, you know, our students, our collaborators to maintain their own unique inputs into this? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm seeing some interesting ver versions of that in, in the chat as well. Um, I think there are sort of two approaches that I would advocate for. Um, one is for those who are really computationally savvy and, and who really love this stuff and, and are trying to get this into the practice. You have a huge amount of control in the art of establishing your design variables. And I think I have found in my own work, it takes a long time and a lot of experience to kind of set those design variables and to parameterize your problem um, in a way that, that kind of, as you said, um, contains the solutions you want. And there's this trade-off between over-parameterizing, which in the one hand is good because then you're more likely to find a surprising result. But the problem then is that you have like way too much nonsense in your space and it's really either hard or impossible to find the good parts or under-parameterizing in which you get a, a result that's that's prescriptive and not surprising. So if, if you're really good at this, I think you can under-parameterize and just be really clever in establishing uh, good design variables. and. One of the things that, that seems really interesting is, is if you impose some performance criteria on the way you define your variables themselves. So for example, you know that you wanna design a compression only structure, but there's still many compression only structures you could design. You could define a design space that only contains compression only structures, but contains a wide range of them. And, and people do that really well, I think. On the other hand, if you're, if you're kind of, you want more variety and you don't, you don't have those things that you can impose, then I think some of the machine learning techniques we're, we're experimenting with and trying to promote can help because then you can you can over parameterize your space, you can have way too many answers, but you can use these learning methods to help you make a bridge between these really large sets of, of options and um, directions or axes, as you said, that, that are that are meaningful. One of the things we are, or I, I hope will happen in the next five years is that in these latent spaces, right now those axes don't, aren't labeled. It's not like I, this one is make the building taller and this one's make the building longer. It's, you know, there, there are these mathematical equations that are very complex that humans have a hard time interpreting. But I think we're gonna get better at that too. And we're gonna be able to even decide like this is, these are the types of axes I would like and, and the learning methods can help us construct those axes from these otherwise over-parameterized spaces. Um, so I think both both methods are are useful, and depending on where you fall in this, you might explore one or the other. Thanks, thanks. That's that's a very very insightful, and, and and it makes us feel that that we still have that role in this process, and the real importance of of the humans in that in that process. Um, I think you can see some of the questions that are that are coming through. If there's you'd like to particularly you know choose a particular topic, um, rather than leaving it up to me to prioritize. Sure. Um, so, so one of one of the questions is about um, the training sets required for surrogate modeling, which is a really important question. Um, 
our, our colleagues in other disciplines that are doing machine learning, like machine learning that you see in the news, for example, based on images and faces, those data sets are in the millions or billions. And so, and, and they exist because of the nature of, of how photographs are disseminated. We don't have that luxury. We usually, in all of the work that I showed, we synthesize our own data, meaning we generate a parametric model, we sample it in some intelligent way, and then we use that data to create the surrogate model. That process itself takes time. We think about that. So we think, can we synthesize all the data we need in a lunch break and a coffee break overnight over a weekend? But I'm sorry, I have no idea why my background just changed. But <laughs> anyway, um, uh, th that's still kind of unsatisfactory, especially because it's still linked to a very specific parametric space. So what we're, we are, as somebody asked, are we thinking about ways to make this more general or universal? And yes, we are. Um, there's something called graph convolutional neural networks, which are a new type of network that operate kind of on a, on a graph um, that can be literally a structure. And so we're starting to think about that as a new way to model structures. And we're also starting to think about transfer learning, which is a way to take an, a previous model that was trained to do one thing and with a little more data, adapt it to do something else. And so this gets into data efficiency, which I think is a, is a super important issue. I think design firms and practices can also contribute th to this by collecting and sharing their own design data so that we can start to build more realistic surrogate models on, on real design models. Um, because you know, design firms have, have thousands or, or you know, tens of thousands of examples in their own records that could be really useful for, uh, for surrogate modeling. So I think I'm, I'm really interested in the question about the level of confidence in the surrogate models predictions. And yeah. I'd like to, uh, to talk about that and maybe to add an extra dimension to that in how, how you use the results from the surrogate model. You know, do you just do you use that result and then you analyze, do, perform structural analysis? Or do you take the results from the surrogate model and then process it through another optimization technique that would take longer, but you choose an answer and produce that full optimization before you analyze it structurally? So. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, so when surrogate modeling was developed, it was again developed in the aerospace field and it was developed for the second, what you just said second. So it was developed to, to make optimizations, especially when computing power was less, to, to make optimization possible. Um, and so they, it was really important that it was high fidelity. It was really important that the surrogate model itself be differentiable so that you could use a gradient based optimizer. It, so they had kind of different goals. What I think surrogate modeling can be useful for now is really for early stage design comparison. And so the metrics of error, one of the things I think is important in error is, does the surrogate model um, accurately get comparative uh, uh, results? So for example, if this design is 10% uh, better than this design in, in real analysis, does the surrogate model also think so, regardless of what the actual values are? I think that's one kind of useful thing. And, and we have found that surrogate models do very, very well typically on that kind of comparative question. Um, I think in general, what we, we find, we do a lot of studies on data efficiency versus error. So you can always make your model better by adding more data. And we do a lot of work in thinking about smart ways with, with low amounts of data to get relatively good errors. Um, but it's also important to think about what error even means because there's so many different ways that error can be measured in, in learning research outside of our world. Um, you know, there's kind of a standard, but what, like, what would we really care about for a model to be correct or not? Um, that's one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, 10% is often given as a, as a reasonable engineering judgment error. And we sort of use that. So we say, can, are, is this model right to the degree that a, an engineer would judge it to be right within 10%? And so that's what we try to apply to this. And I think giving ways for architects and engineers to understand the error of their surrogate models is, is also going to be really important if they become used in practice. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, that um, the, the question of that accuracy is about maybe changing the user's perceptions because maybe the user isn't asking for it to be the, you know, it's not a, a sort of, um, you know, construction stage design question. Mm -hmm. So you're not looking at structural safety and the, the level of concern over that accuracy. You're maybe looking for ideation and, and conversation around something. And so you can allow a bit of that, that relaxation. Yeah, totally. And um, obviously, uh, all of the, the full analysis that is required both by code and by our moral obligation as engineers should remain in the design process. I am not proposing that we yeah. <laughs> re remove that and only use these like approximations. But I think these approximations can lead us to good ideas better than the processes we have now. And then we can use all of that existing machinery that we have to do all these really important structural validations um, 
once we have a few of these good ideas uh, that we're directed to through these methods. And I love that that links to what you said um, towards the beginning of your presentation, that it's about identifying, finding what is the, the one optimum, and then you're exploring everything around that. But you have your theoretical optimum and your, as your benchmark, you have your business as usual over here, and you're exploring everything in between, but knowing where those bounds are is so important to in order to be exploring the area between otherwise you don't have a map for what you're exploring yeah absolutely um what the, oh sorry go ahead sorry I, I was about to suggest you choose another question so. <laughs> so someone has asked um what are the best ways for practices to work with research groups to push their tools and methods into practice um i, th I think that's a great question i think there's a lot of interesting work going on in parallel right now and so events like this where there's the possibility for some exchange are, are really useful. Um, I, I, I know I could, speaking for myself and my research group, we are very, very happy to go and, and give free workshops at, at firms and, and work on like teaching some of these tools to, to people who are interested in using them. So that's certainly a venue, please contact me if you're interested. Um, I also think you know longer term case studies where there are pro projects, especially projects that are in the very early stages of design where some of these things could be tested. Um, are, are really needed. And, and again, we're very eager to find those kinds of case studies. And we do try to work with, with firms on, on those kinds of examples as much as we can, but we'd always love to have more. So, so please reach out if you're, if you're interested in working with us. Can I offer a, a, a sort of industry perspective um, of course, for, on that question as well? Please. Um, that I think that one of the things that as a structural engineering practitioner, I'm most looking for in collaborating with academics is you know, caring what we think. And showing that you are having, you, we have the same priorities. You know, everything that you're presenting here is all there. Those are the same goals that I have in practice. And so, if you're asking us to input and to give our thoughts and say, "What do you think about this? Would this be useful in practice? How does this work with the cost models that your contractors are, are, are working with? You know, what are the connections with the fabrication process? You know, asking for that involvement." is how to really pull in people and that will in return in my view then push back out the products of that of the that research and back into the industry that, that's a great point and you know i'm sure academics can be accused of working on things that are <laughs> of, acad of, of only academic interest and i certainly don't want to be do you know it, it's of course it's really important that this is useful and of interest so so i think that's a, a really important comment thank you i think i think you're safe in that respect that um <laughs> the industry professionals watching this and myself included are definitely interested in, in what but, well, one other thing that i applicable. that i worry about a little bit along those lines is that um going back to what i was talking about in the beginning about diversity um there's some worry that these tools become so branded and visually kind of narrow that that firms start to think, well, this that tool belongs to firm X and they produce this type of visual result. And therefore we can't do that because we have our own brand and we need to differ, differentiate ourselves. And I mean, that totally makes sense. So I really am interested in how to push past that and really how to use these approaches in very diverse ways that can support diverse aesthetics, diverse branding, diverse um, kind of agendas of different firms. And so I, I'm sure, you know, as, a, as an engineer, you, you also encounter that working with different architects, but I, that, that is something I just think is uh, critical so that these tools don't reach their global optimum and then are abandoned. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, nobody, nobody's copy copyrighted, to my knowledge, um, the sort of the Michel structures and, and theoretical <laughs> forms that are the basis of this, that are hundreds of, you know, hundred years old. Um, but we're already seeing some practitioners taking those further forward than others. So I, I think you're completely right that, that that's going to sort of evoke a certain a thought. And so giving that diversity and breadth to everybody using them is really important. Okay, somebody asked, uh, they want to know my opinion on commu computer imagination. I think that is maybe a nice one to finish on. And I'm sure we all, we all have an opinion about this. Um, Personally, I, I am very intrigued by the idea of uh, the computer as a creative agent and as an, you know, as, as a, someone, uh, an agent who can contribute to imagination. I think some people do not like that and some, some people feel that that's, uh, you know, moving towards the erasure of a profession or multiple professions. I, I think it's really, as you said in the beginning, Catherine, it's really 
we should think of ourselves as creative in how we work with the computer. It's, it's not that the computer itself will fully automate a design process, even if it does participate in generative work or ideation or imagination, it's still in collaboration with us, just like a wonderful collaboration between an architect and an engineer works today. Um, if an engineer is contributing to an architect's work, that doesn't mean the architect is somehow diminished in their own creative potential. The architect is, is, is an equal creative partner. And I think that's how we can think about computation as well, not as a way to replace anyone, but as a way to expand all of our potentials. And yeah, so I, I do really think the computer can be creative and that the computer can give us ideas we would not have um, by ourselves. And I'm, I'm personally very excited by that and, and hope we can see um, more examples and more, more compelling examples of that in the future. Thank you, I, I agree. I think that's a, a really wonderful note to finish on and um, to draw upon the collaborations that we're trying to build among each other and everybody who's been presented today. And the computer is just one more collaborator that we need to work with and have the same respect for as we do with any other, um, any other collaboration that we go about. So thank you so much again for your incredibly insightful presentation. Um, I think we'll we'll draw this session to a close now and I'll make a few remarks um, and, uh, and let people know about a few upcoming things. So thank you so much, Caitlin, for your time here. Thank you so much. <laughs>